Hello and welcome to The Reason live stream. I'm Zach Weissmuller, joined by my colleague, Nick Gillespie. Hey, Nick. Hey, Matt. Uh, Matt and Zach, good to see you. Uh, yep, and yeah, today uh, we're going to talk with Matt Ridley, who's uh, joining us uh, to examine in great detail some of the recent developments in the origins of COVID mystery, largely tied to documents and recent testimony in the House Select Committee investigation. Uh, and Matt Ridley, uh, science journalist, co-author of a book on this very topic, Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19, is here to help us out. Matt, thank you for talking with us today. Zach, it's good to be with you again. Thanks for, for having me on the show. Yeah, uh, a pleasure to have you. And I interviewed you and your co-author, Alina Chan, a mm -hmm. molecular biologist and one of the earliest and most outspoken skeptics of the animal market spillover story around when your book came out in November 2021. And you had this to say about the state of the search for COVID's origins. Documents show that EcoHealth Alliance worked with the Wuhan Institute of Virology to make several bat-borne SARS-like coronaviruses and even MERS more infectious to human cells. Chan and Ridley say that when they started writing the book, they didn't have a strong view about which theory was correct. But these recent revelations have shifted their thinking in favor of the lab leak theory. In light of grant proposals and reports released within the past few months, Chan wrote on Twitter, we know novel SARS-like viruses were being synthesized and engineered at unprecedented scale. That changed my mind completely. So knowing that there actually was a, a plan, a pipeline, a protocol for doing this work. Uh How optimistic or pessimistic are you that we ever will get to the truth of the matter here? I'm generally optimistic. I think truth will out here. It may take a long time, but I think there are people who know what happened, whatever it happened, you know, even if it's just what happened in a, in a market, there are people who know. Mm -hmm. And I can't help thinking that at some point we will be able to find out who they are and ask them, even in a regime as repressive and controlling as China's. So I hope we do find out. There are plenty of people who say it's too late, we've lost the chance, we'll never find out. I'm not one of them, at least not yet. So with the time that's passed and all the material that's come to light since then, which we're about to get into, are you more or less optimistic that we are going to get answers? I'm about the same. I'm still optimistic that we are going to get answers. Uh, I think it'll be very difficult to keep this vitally important question secret forever because there are people who know uh, and I'll give you an example of why we why I think that is the case um, in uh, April uh, George Gao came to Geneva he's the he was the head of the Chinese CDC Centers for Disease Control based in Beijing and he was the man who really triggered my uh, interest in this because he he announced in May of 2020 that he thought the market was irrelevant to the story, uh, that it was a super spreader event and not uh, the origin. So it was with some excitement that I realized I had a chance to meet him in Geneva this year, uh, along with Alina. We both talked to him at some length, uh, and he was pretty clear, although not in so many words, that the market theory... Uh, is not tenable, uh, but that you can't rule out the lab theory. Now, if that's coming from an, a senior official in China, um, I mean, he repeated the same thing to the BBC and to Vanity Fair shortly afterwards and was uh, forced to retract some of his remarks by the regime. So uh, I, I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of him in the Western media from now on. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's a very open and affable person. And, you know, uh, just imagine how difficult it's going to be uh, for the Chinese regime to make sure that every scientist who travels abroad over the next few years, who has had some knowledge of what went on in Wuhan in 2019, um, doesn't sing like a canary when they get here. Mm. And you mentioned in that answer that it's a vitally important question. That's one line of response I've seen as, as more and more people have 
come to believe, accept this as a real possibility. And by the way, we have some polling numbers here mm -hmm. that show two thirds of Americans say it's definitely or probably true that the virus uh, originated in a lab in China. That's up from a little less than 50 percent in 2020. And if you really dig into this, you see a real partisan divide and who believes or doesn't believe that. Uh, but before we get into that, um, you know, one of the responses I've seen is, well, like, how much does it really matter? Uh, why is this a vitally important question to get the answer to? Well, three reasons, in my view. Uh, the first is that 20 million people are dead and we owe it to their uh, memory to find out how and why. Uh, you know, if, if, if 200 people die in an airline crash, we don't say, well, we may never find out. Let's not bother to try and find out. We, we owe it to the people who've, who've died and the people whose lives were turned upside down. Secondly, we need to find out because it will help us to make sure it doesn't happen again. People say, well, it doesn't matter which way it happened. We still ought to be taking measures to make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah, but that's not the way the world works. Uh, the way the world works is that virology research of the kind that might have led to this accident, including collecting wild bat viruses and bringing them to labs in cities, is still happening. And the third reason why we need to uh, find out uh, is because bad actors have watched this episode with great interest. Terrorists, uh, rogue states like North Korea, um, they are realizing that putting together a, an infectious virus, not necessarily a very lethal virus, but an infectious virus and releasing it can bring the, the Western world to its knees pretty quickly. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, they probably haven't got the expertise to do it, let alone in secret. But you can bet your bottom, bottom dollar that ISIS and North Korea would quite like to do that uh, at some point. It's a very cheap way of, of waging war. Uh, and the best part of it is that if they did that, the Western world, at least the World Health Organization, would shrug its shoulders and say, we may, may never find out how it happened. Mm. Oh. So that's another reason why we should try and find out. Do you, uh, you know, how does it feel to kind of see the world uh, and certainly the United States and I suspect uh, the UK as well kind of start to come to your position um, that the lab leak theory is plausible and should be investigated? Because when you first started talking about this, you know, this was the type of view that could get people kicked off of social media or, you know, at the very least get a lot of social opprobrium, um, you know. Do you take any satisfaction in, um, you know, kind of seeing people be, say like, oh, this is, you know, maybe really what we should be investigating? Over the course of my career, I've tried to persuade the public of a number <clears> of things. <throat> uh, and I've rarely been successful in shifting public opinion in mm -hmm. my direction. This one is... Well, you know, people, some people probably <laughs> more believe in evolution now than they did before you started writing, so... <laughs> right, but... You know, it's a slow grind usually. Yeah. And now I'm not going to take credit for the shift in public right. opinion, but but I am going to say that um, when I explain the arguments, explain the evidence, explain the data, mm. uh, the coincidence of time and place, the kind of work that was going on in the Wuhan lab, the kind of behavior of the of the researchers and and the regime after the the uh, um, event began. Um, people are very quickly persuaded that there is at least a strong case to answer. And you see that in those polls, you know, two thirds of Americans. And yes, you said there's, it's on partisan lines, but not that strongly. You know, I mean, an awful lot of Democrats also mm -hmm. think that it's probably out of a lab. Yeah. According, um, according to this poll, as of March 4th, 2023, it is uh, 54% uh, of Democrats, so over half of Democrats, Back in right. 2020, that number was uh, 33. The number of Republicans back then was 72 percent. So, yeah, th that's the, the partisan divide, which I'm sure has, uh, you know, for someone like you who's trying to investigate this from a non through a nonpartisan lens, uh, that must have presented, you know, some challenges. Yes, but the, the, the challenge, the, the, the disconnect that I think is more important is the disconnect between what the public thinks and what the 
scientific establishment thinks. Mm. Because on the whole, most of the scientific establishment, Nature magazine, Science magazine, the Academy of Medical Sciences in this country, the Royal Society in the US, the uh, 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 main academies and so on, they on the whole take the view, no, no, we can rule out a lab leak. No. We have proved it was from the market. Now, if you if you really think that, if you really think it's it's a, not even a starter, then you should be very concerned that sixty six percent of the public disagree with you, and you should be out there making your case from the rooftops. What's so striking is that the scientists on that side of the debate don't want to engage with the argument. They want to just say it's. Let's let it go away. It's over. It's finished. Instead of trying to bring these 66% round to their point of view. Is there um, any sign that the World Health Organization is shifting, if not its rhetoric, its practice? Because, you know, from the beginning, really, and I think rightly, uh, the WHO came in for a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, negative criticism. Um, where, you know, are they doing anything differently? I'm afraid not, as far as I can tell. Um, they set up uh, an organization called SAGO, which is a scientific advisory group on origin of novel pathogens. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to have achieved anything or announced anything. Um, the work that WHO is doing through that, through that group and others is mostly still focused. Their conferences are mostly still focused on natural emergence of viruses. Uh, you know, the forward-looking work, it doesn't say natural emergence and lab-based emergence, which it surely should do. Um, the WHO, in my view, uh, played a crucial role in helping to rehabilitate the lab theory by accident, because what they did was they went uh, in late 20. Uh, 20 into sorry early 2021 into Wuhan um, conducted a pretty farcical uh, and superficial investigation and then sat down at a press conference with the Chinese authorities and announced that a lab leak was extremely unlikely and more likely was that it came to China on frozen food probably from abroad now that's a Chinese uh, authorities idea that has no credibility whatsoever uh, and so by endorsing it, the World Health Organization effectively shot itself in the foot, uh, made it, uh, you know, made itself look really ridiculous. And it was very shortly after that that a large group of scientists wrote to Science magazine and said, this is not good enough. It may well have come from a lab. That possibility needs to be taken seriously. And that was really the breaking of the dam. That was the moment when, for example, Facebook stopped stopped censoring um, the lab leak as a mm. conspiracy theory. You said that uh, uh, the scientific community is not really eager to this day to talk about this topic or debate it. Uh, they are in the U.S. being forced to talk about it and debate it because they're being pulled in front of a congressional committee. This is a report that was put out by the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic uh, called the proximal origin of a cover-up. Did the Bethesda boys downplay a lab leak? Again, here in the U.S., we're looking at this. Th this is for very much in a partisan lens. So Republicans control the House. This is a House-controlled committee. Nonetheless, they've got access to real documents that the rest of us were not able to have access to at this point. And that's what we're going to go through uh, now a, a little bit. This is from their executive summary. Uh, their kind of bottom line here is that this, the proximal origins paper, which we'll talk about what that is in just a second, is one of the single most impactful and influential scientific papers in history. And it expressed conclusions that were not based on sound science nor in fact, but instead on assumptions, the question is why. So that was the frame that they went into this with. And this is the paper that they are referencing, the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2 published March 17th, 2020. They said it was in that uh, previous document that it's an extremely influential paper that's been accessed 5.84 million times as the as at time of that publication. Uh, could you just 
talk a little bit about this paper, Matt. Uh, what is it? What's its import? How, how much of an impact has it had on the debate? Yes, they're not wrong. This is an extremely important paper. It was extremely important for me, too. Uh, I was in uh, the House of Lords at the time. I was being asked by a number of colleagues uh, who were, who said, you know a bit about biology. Um, what do you reckon about this idea that the virus came out of the lab? And I was going around saying, no, it didn't. The reason I know that is an influential paper with uh, five authors has been published in Nature Medicine, and it comes to a firm conclusion that no lab-based scenario is plausible. Now, I haven't uh, followed every twist and turn of their argument yet, so I can't judge it, but uh, that seems to me pretty um, slam dunk. Now, I was wrong. Um, there was no good argument in that paper, and I read it and I reread it, and over the month or two after it came out, uh, I found myself wondering why the arguments it put forward were so uh, conclusive, because they didn't seem to be. For one thing, they mentioned the pangolin virus as being mm -hmm. a, a new uh, breakthrough that implied that this vir that the SARS-CoV-2 might have been in, in, in the pangolin species. But the problem with that is that uh, it doesn't have the crucial feature of SARS-CoV-2, the furin cleavage site, that makes it so infectious, that makes it effectively, effectively a respiratory rather than an enteric disease. Um, and uh, uh, so the and, and you know so the pang and the pangolin virus can't be the ancestor. Uh, then they mentioned something called O-link glycans. I didn't understand what those were at the time, so I had to you know go back and teach myself a little uh, glycosylation biology to to, to understand that. Um, and even they have now said that's no strong argument. And mm. then they produced an argument that really one should have seen through straight away. And I'm kicking myself for not being more skeptical very early on. Uh, and that is that the, um, the furin cleavage site and the receptor binding domain, the bit that attaches to the human cells and gets in there, isn't as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. It could be better it's 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 suboptimal you could, and if you were going to design it you'd have designed it better well there's two arguments uh, against that the first is where did you get this idea that human beings always get everything perfectly right first time of course you might come up with a design that was suboptimal uh, and the second is that it may be suboptimal to you but it's pretty darn good it's hmm. killed 20 million people now Right. It's extremely infectious, <laughs> you yeah. know. So, so it, it, you know, those are th the three main arguments in proximal yeah. origin for why they could reject a lab-based scenario. It was not in the least persuasive in that mm. respect, but it was extraordinarily influential, not just on me, but on many, many other scientists. Yeah. What, uh, what, uh, <coughs> excuse me, very briefly, what explains, you know, your interest in embracing the paper is it partly that it's coming from very reputable people in a very reputable outlet <clears throat> is it you know at that point in a pandemic we were just looking for a reason for this not to be the you know a, a result of human you know human intervention into things um two reasons one yes it they were reputable people <clears throat> They were uh, uh, um, virologists. They were people studying evolutionary biology. And uh, generally, I'm an evolutionary biologist myself by training. Uh, I have respect for these kind of people. They, they usually know what they're talking about. Um, but the other reason why it fell on fertile ground with me was because I had a, I guess you'd call it a Bayesian prior, a, 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 an assumption going into this, which is that... Uh, good as we are at genetic engineering, we're not smart enough to produce uh, de novo viruses that, that, that are beautifully designed. Mother Nature is a way better genetic engineer than we will ever be. Uh, and I had underestimated the progress that had been made in molecular virology over the past 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. I hadn't been following the, the, the the subject particularly closely, and the degree to which they knew exactly how to tweak uh, a 
binding domain or a furin cleavage site to um, to switch a virus onto a different type of cell or a different type of organism. Well, you know, you mentioned that there's this number of logical gaps in the argument of the paper, uh, and that th that makes it not very persuasive. And anyone who sort of knows what they're talking about can start to pick up on those gaps. And what we've seen, I think, since we last spoke uh, with some of these documents that we're about to get into is that the authors of the paper were keenly aware of these logical leaps as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question becomes, how did and why did this paper start with a certain conclusion and end up somewhere much different? And the, the, the first thing that we can look at uh, is this email on January 31st from Christian Anderson. He's the lead author of the paper. He's writing to Anthony Fauci. This, this is before the paper, this is kind of what kicked off the creation of the paper. And he writes here about that he's looked at the sequence, he's looked at the genetic sequence of the virus, and that the un, when you look closely, the unusual features of the virus make up a really small part of the genome. So one has to look really closely to see that some of the features look potentially engineered. Then Anderson goes on to say in his testimony and elsewhere that Fauci then uh, encouraged him if he thinks that there's something strange here to start looking into this question and, and putting a paper together. Uh, this We now have access to some of the earlier drafts of the paper. The paper came out, it, it was officially published in March. This is from February 1st. So this is like the first draft of the paper. Uh, and he says, uh, or the, the authors say, it is impossible to distinguish whether this strange furin cleavage site was gained uh, due to evolution or passage. And by passage, they mean kind of continually infecting animals in the lab to increase the you know, transmissibility or whatever of the virus. Uh, and the data is consistent with either scenario. So that was the first draft. If we jump to the final draft here, the conclusion is since we observed all notable SARS-CoV-2 features, including the optimized RBD and polybasic cleavage site in related coronaviruses in nature, we do not believe that any type of laboratory-based scenario is plausible. So they went from it's impossible to tell to the, the end uh, here is that any kind of laboratory-based scenario, whether it's engineering or you know passing through mice over and over again, is not plausible at all. And the question that this group is trying to get to is how did how did that process work? What 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 was it the you know normal scientific inquiry that led you there or was there pressure coming in? And one of the emails they highlighted was this one between Christian Anderson and the editor of Nature magazine where it would ultimately be published saying that um, you know admitting that this was prompted by Tony Fauci, Francis Collins, Jeremy Ferrer, who was a, a colleague in the UK. Um, and uh, this is so, you know, the the committee points to this as kind of like here. Th this proves right here that Fauci from the very beginning, you know, created this paper and he did so for a certain reason. I want to quickly play. Uh, Christian Anderson's response to that uh, in his congressional testimony, and then get you to weigh in on all of that, Matt, and and tell me, you know, what what to make of all this. When I outlined my initial hypothesis about a potentially engineered virus, Dr. Fauci told me, and I'm paraphrasing here, if you think this virus came from a lab, you should write a scientific paper about it. Not only is this not a prompt to disprove the lab leak theory, it was specifically predicated on our initial hypothesis of a lab-associated virus. The allegations that Dr. Fauci prompted the drafting of proximal origin to disprove the lab leak is quote mine from an email I wrote to participants of the February 1 conference call. 
The scientific method is based on two basic concepts of one, formulating hypotheses, and two, testing those hypotheses, often by trying to disprove them. My initial hypothesis was a lab theory. When I stated that we were trying to disprove any type of lab theory, I was specifically referring to us testing our early hypothesis. This is textbook science in action. What's your reaction to that? Was Do you believe that Anderson was kind of in a good faith way just trying to follow the scientific method and that is how this conclusion was ultimately reached? No, I'm afraid I don't. Um, I corresponded with Christian Anderson at, at the time. Uh, he gave no indication that he was considering a lab leak as even a possibility. I think it's worth just going back to the timeline uh, and, and working out what happens. You're quite right to, to show that Christian Anderson raised with Tony Fauci the possibility that this virus was engineered in, on the 31st of January uh, 2020. And he wasn't the only one raising this query because Jeremy Farrer at the Wellcome Trust in the UK was talking to Eddie Holmes in Australia uh, and Robert Gary was joining in and uh, Andrew Rambo in Edinburgh. Basically, um, uh, as, as Farrer recounts in a book that he's written, um, these guys were saying 60-40, 80-20, 50-50, we think this was engineered. And that's why everyone was raising this with Fauci and saying there needs to be a conversation about how we deal with this possibility. Uh, and that conversation indeed took place on the 1st of February, the Saturday, as we now know. Um, and um, sorry, let me just pause there and go back to Christian Anderson's remark about the scientific method as it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. If you have that concern why not share it with the world? Hmm. He never indicated that he even thought that, and nor did any of those other authors, until uh, further information came to light many months later. He never said in February, March, or indeed even April 2020, by the way, we did look at whether it was potentially engineered because we couldn't figure out a way in which that furin cleavage site had been inserted, added to the genome, unless by engineering it didn't look natural. Robert Gary was very explicit on that point. He said it doesn't look... Well, I can't think of a, an evolutionary mechanism by which that could have been added. So, um, and, and over the... Following days after that conference call, Christian Anderson makes some really very good arguments as to why we need to keep considering this lab-based scenario in private. Mm -hmm. But he never breathes any of this in public. Now, the, after the conference call on uh, Saturday, February the 1st, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 on the conference call were two... Uh, Dutch scientists, Ron Fouchier and uh, Marion Koopmans, who argued strongly that it was a mistake to even consider this possibility. One of the reasons they gave was because it might open a Pandora's box of speculating about the origin of other pandemics, including Ebola. That's effectively a sort of warning. You know, watch it, chaps. This might, this might rebound on you. Mm. Um, and interestingly, though, the, 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 uh, and, and the, these two knew a lot more about coronavirus biology than Christian Anderson did. Eddie Holmes knew quite a lot, but, but Gary and Anderson were basically Ebola experts, not, not uh, coronavirus experts. There's one name, by the way, which who wasn't on the meeting and should have been and knew far more about coronavirus biology than any of these people, and that's Ralph Barrick in North Carolina, who somehow seems to have stayed well clear of this whole process, but that's mm -hmm. another interesting question. Anyway, the, the point is that after that, as, as a result of that phone call, it was agreed that Anderson would draft a paper. And the original suggestion was as indeed he said in that testimony, that it should consider the lab leak 
and the evidence for and against it. Mm -hmm. But Fouchier's and Koopman's uh, strong view that this was going to be a mistake mm -hmm. comes through in subsequent emails and they then got very upset, by the way, when their arguments were suddenly adopted into Anderson's draft without their, their uh, yeah. names appearing. And um, meanwhile, we have Fauci and Farrar uh, and to some extent Francis Collins contributing suggestions in the drafting, quite specific suggestions, yeah. which means their names should have been on the paper. Yeah, let me pull up one quick example of a suggestion that Farrar uh, added to the document. Uh, this was on February 17th, right? The day the prox Proximal Origin was first published publicly, uh, he asks Anderson, would you be willing to change one sentence from it's unlikely that SARS-CoV-2 emerged through laboratory manipulation to it's improbable that SARS-CoV-2 emerged through laboratory manipulation? And then... Uh, Anderson responds, sure, no, no problem. And then as we saw earlier, the final language is much more like uh, it's the, the, there's very low probability that this, oh, let's see the exact, uh, yeah. Um, we do not believe any type of lab. Improbable to it's implausible. I, I don't know how much the semantics matter, but it seems like it's getting like less and less uh, likely the more the kind of edits come in from the top. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so th there's a process of sh shifting the paper from uh, open-minded discussion of the lab leak of the kind that Christian Anderson talked about in his testimony to a dogmatic dismissal of the possibility mm -hmm. uh, on all counts. Yeah. And uh, uh, as it becomes effectively the Fauchier and Koopman's view and not the Anderson view yet it has anderson's name on it who is pressuring them to do that there is one email that refers to the higher ups wanting this to happen um there is there are also exchanges between anderson and others uh, that I mean, there's one that came out just 24 hours ago uh, in which he says it's frigging well possible he uses the word frigging yeah um frigging well hmm. possible that it did come out of a lab you know in private anderson is doing all the right things he's raising all these questions and yet he's the senior author on a paper that comes out completely dismissing the possibility there's a little pangolin uh, thing in here too because during that week between the 1st and the 8th of February um, uh, rumors spread that there was an announcement coming about uh, pangolins uh, the pangolin announcement was uh, made uh, uh, by a South China University that they'd found a very similar uh, virus in pangolins and they even said that it was 99% the same and there was great excitement. And uh, Francis Collins wrote to Jeremy Farrer and said, oh, good, I assume it has the fear and cleavage. Oh, no, does it have the fear and cleavage site? Um, and uh, by the end of that week, they knew that it did not have the fear and cleavage site. And so there's an exchange between Anderson and an editor at Nature magazine in which she says, can't you make this stronger, this document? Can't you um, d dismiss the possibility altogether? Because isn't that what we're trying to do? Hmm. Uh, and surely the pangolins are evidence for that. And he patiently explains to her, no, I'm afraid the pangolins don't really help us here. Is this yeah, the email, this is from the email Christian from, uh, between Thomas. Christian Anderson and Claire Thomas? And, yeah. uh, you know, you, you set it up there and what he's, hmm typically says is the more sequences we see from pangolins uh, and we've been analyzing these very carefully, the more unlikely it seems that they're the intermediate hosts. Unlikely they have a direct connection to the COVID-19 epidemic. None of this helps refute a lab origin and the possibility must be considered as a serious scientific theory, which is what we do, and not dismissed out of hand as another quote conspiracy theory. We really, really wish we could do that in parentheses, that's how this got started. But unfortunately, it's not possible hmm. in the data. It's interesting with the pangolins too, you know, uh, Robert Gary, uh, we have a clip of him and he's still, uh, you know. Still citing the pangolins. Yeah. yeah. As the Can bef that he changed his mind. Yeah, Nick, go ahead. Before, before we get to the pangolins, could you just dilate a little bit on 
Why were the Dutch uh, scientists or researchers so emphatic that you don't want to open up the idea that this is engineered? And what, what's the connection there with Ebola? Um, Fauchier had been uh, the main protagonist in a very controversial episode uh, about 10 years ago, which led to the whole debate about gain-of-function research. He planned to do an experiment uh, in which uh, bird flu would be infected into ferrets and would be manipulated in such a way genomically that it would then become possible for the ferrets to infect other ferrets through the air, in effect turning a bird virus into a mammal virus. Now, he knew that was a very dangerous thing to do because, you know, you're effectively turning it into something that might be able to infect human beings at some point. Uh, so the experiment was very carefully um, planned, very carefully controlled, done under very um, uh, strict conditions, etc. But it, it led to a huge debate in the scientific community, in the scientific journals, about whether we should even be doing these kinds of experiments. Um, uh, and... Uh, it, the, a, a group called the Cambridge Working Group was set up to campaign within science against doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Fauci eventually came down on the side of continuing to do these kind of, of experiments. But somewhat out of the blue in, in 2014, the Obama administration did suddenly pause any funding of such experiments. It effectively banned gain-of-function research of this kind. Um, that ban was lifted in 2017 under Donald Trump, but probably under the influence of Anthony Fauci, in, mm -hmm. in effect, because uh, he had always argued that we should continue these kinds of experiments. So Fauci had scars on his back from this controversial episode and had been on the side of doing risky experiments in order to help humanity. You know, I mean, he wasn't yeah. motivated by trying to do evil things, of course. Um, Koopmans is not really one of these lab-based virologists at all. She's an expert in um, uh, how uh, viruses are picked up from animals in the wild, the zoonosis stuff. And she was particularly crucial in, in, in finding out how MERS entered the human species in 2012 via camels from bats. So she was very much in the uh, camp that says this is probably a, um, a zoonotic event. Mm. Um, uh, but she had no particular reason, I think, to know that a lab-based scenario was impossible or implausible. And we'll return to the gain of function question in a minute, because that may help explain some of the motivations for coming to this conclusion in this paper. But I think it is worth dissecting the, the anatomy a little bit more of how this all fit together. And the pangolins that you mentioned are an uh, important component, because there, there was a time when that paper first came out, when it was like, the scientists were on social media and in papers declaring, okay, we figured it out. It's the pangolins. That now is not a serious theory, yet it is what uh, Bob Gary uh, advanced here in his congressional testimony as his reason for re getting from that initial, you know, much weaker claim that we don't know whether this is laboratory or zoo to the stronger claim of uh, this is it's totally it's, it's implausible that it came from a lab. So let's play that clip and get your reaction to it. I just can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature, unquote. So then within a matter of days, something changed. And that's what this committee is trying to get to the bottom of. What happened within that three-day period between the conference call and the paper that all of a sudden you did a 180 and it couldn't possibly come from a lab or maybe, but you're all saying that, you know, this was by sure from nature. What happened in those three days? Um, 
Well, we examined the genomes more closely. We looked at other coronaviruses, and um, there was some new data that came. There was Where did the, that data come from? Um, the scientific literature, you know, the publication what, what? of the pangolin genomic sequence showed that there was a receptor binding domain that was very close to the... And exactly what uh, my colleague here brought up. Yes, exactly. You have stated that pangolins may have played some role in the recombination event that led to the COVID pandemic. Is that correct? That is not correct. I don't think pangolins have played a role in the pandemic per se. The fact that we find similar viruses in pangolins and there is a recombinant history of the virus them themselves, however, that recombinant history is very likely in bats. Thank you, Dr. Gary. In, in pangolins. You're, you're... So, so I agree. I don't think there's a direct route from a pangolin to SARS-CoV-2. So w what's going on there, in, in your opinion? Are, are they, like, wh why, why is he bringing this up? Is he saying that it was at the time he believed that uh, it was the pangolins and that's why they revised it, but now they don't, or that there's some mechanism that the pangolin paper like illuminated for them? What's your interpretation of, of that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very complicated, but um, uh, Robert Gary said there quite clearly when asked what scientific information had changed his minds in three days between the 1st and the 4th of February, he said the only uh, new information he could cite was the pangolins. And he's right. There is no other data that was published in that period that could possibly be used to um, help illuminate this problem it wasn't you know he said we looked at other coronaviruses nothing new came out except that it was announced that pangolins had a similar virus in well by the end of that week they knew that that pangolin virus did not have a furin cleavage site the very feature that had alerted them to the possibility that it might be uh, uh, partly man-made because um, you know, no SARS-like coronavirus had ever been seen with a furin cleavage site in it, let alone one that's inserted, added. You know, it, it actually interrupts the existing sequence and, and juts in at that point. Um, so the pangolins don't provide an answer to that. Um, the problem was that the way the Chinese scientists had announced the pangolin discovery was to overhype it. They had come out with a a press release saying we have a 99% similar virus. And uh, everyone said, problem solved. We've found the intermediate species, as you say. It wasn't for another three weeks that we saw, that the world saw, the actual genomes of those pangolin viruses and saw that they were 90% similar to SARS-CoV-2, not 99%. Vastly different, in other words. I mean, you know, that's a ten percent is an enormous genetic difference. So they couldn't possibly be the ancestors. Um, and as I say, they didn't have the furin cleavage site. Now, those four papers about pangolins that came out were a mess. And it was my co-author Alina Chan who pointed out that two of them used the same data set under different names. Well, that's practically fraudulent, actually you know, to, to republish the same data set under different labels. Um, they had uh, they, they, their, their numbers and their details just didn't add up. They had all the hallmarks of a rush job to try and get something out there to imply that there was a, uh, a, a connection to a, a, an animal that might have been on sale in the market. Yeah. By the way, there were no pangolins on sale in the <laughs> Wuhan seafood market. Just right. Is, and is and the presumption yeah. with um, the Chinese papers that they were doing the bidding, you know, explicitly of the government or how, how does that work? You know, we were talking a little bit ago about this is how science works. Science is always taking place within a political context, you know, certainly within the United States and the OECD, uh, but also in China. Um, you know, what what explains the sloppiness do you think of the of the Chinese papers? 
Well, there was an edict went out in January, no publication of any scientific speculation or data uh, without the say-so of the regime. That was made very clear, uh, and that was part of when a, a major general from the People's Liberation Army was appointed to uh, run the Wuhan Institute of Virology, a major general with relevant virology expertise. She's not, uh, she's not just a general, she is a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, under strict military control and with no publication, no communication, mm -hmm. no talking to journalists by any scientist in Wuhan or elsewhere without the regime's approval. So, yes, these Pangolin papers were um, uh, uh, approved, if, if mm -hmm. not actually promoted. Now, yeah. sorry, I just want to make one slightly speculative point. Uh -huh. Several of us have looked hard at this pangolin data, and we're not convinced that a pangolin ever had a virus. Hmm. What do I mean by that? Well, um, there's been no sign of these, these viruses in wild pangolins. Um, most of the confiscated smuggled pangolins that we're talking about were not infected with coronavirus. They had other viruses in them, but they didn't have. Only two of the um, sample in question had uh, apparently very small traces of this virus in them. Now, where was this sequencing done that discovered these traces? It was in Guangdong in southern China, nowhere near Wuhan, by the way. Um, and that very institute, the GIABR, uh, the Guangdong Institute for Applied Biological Research, had been handling bats from Wuhan no, sorry, not Wuhan, Yunnan, which is where we think that the natural reservoir of SARS-like coronaviruses is, mm -hmm. shortly before this. So it's possible that we're talking about a case of contamination of a sequencing machine by a bat virus that was then attributed to the pangolins. Mm -hmm. um, wow. uh, you know, it could be something as simple as that. This happens all the time, by the way. You get yeah. contamination of sequencing machines. It's very difficult to avoid. And and whoever's been using the machine before you, uh, there was a famous case um, that seemed to show uh, SARS-CoV-2 in Antarctic soil samples from before December 2020. Um, what? You know, how could that be? Well, it, it's a case of contamination. The yeah. same institute that was sampling the Antarctic soil samples that machine had been used um, early in the pandemic for sampling SARS-CoV-2. So um, it, the pangolins are a red herring in every conceivable sense. Yeah, and, and I think the important thing to uh, underline there is that, you know, they were a red herring and also one that, you know, Christian Anderson himself was not buying, as we saw in those previous documents, in the very testimony that uh, in, in front of uh, Congress, and it's just that that ongoing pattern of a the difference between like the what's put out publicly and these chats and emails that are happening behind the scenes. One of the most egregious ones that has come out in recent days that kind of put a a bow on this section, I think, is you know in his opening written testimony. This is what Christian Anderson says about these final conclusions that his paper came to. By the time we published our final version of Proximal Origin, I no longer believed that cult the culturing scenario was plausible. So that's the scenario where it was, you know, sent through tissue over and over in a lab. He, by the beginning, he thought it was, you know, possible. By the end, he thought it was not plausible. And, and that's why they came to that conclusion. Well, on their Substack, uh, Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger uh, obtained some of the Slack chats from uh, Anderson and some of his colleagues. This is from April 16th, 2020. This is a month after the final publication of the paper. He tells his colleague, uh, Andrew uh, Rambout, uh, that here's the issue. I'm still not fully convinced that no culture was involved. If culture was involved, then the prior completely changes because this could have happened with any random SARS like cub, which there are many. I really, really want to go out there, gun swinging, say, don't be such an idiot believing these dumb theories. The president is deflecting from the real problems, but I'm worried that we can't fully disprove culture. We also can't fully rule out engineering for basic research. Yes, no obvious signs of engineering anywhere, but that furin site could have been inserted. 
via Gibson assembly. I mean, that, a, you know, it, if I were Christian Anderson's attorney, I, I would be concerned <laughs> seeing these two documents right next to each other. Um, but uh, I, I think that the committee has established that there was, at the very least, a very large public-private gap and um, that there was some level of pressure coming both from our the, the top levels of our public health institutions, but also peer pressure from the peer reviewers who wanted a certain outcome. And I guess the main question is that they can't really be answered is like how much of this was you know, nefarious and how much was like confirmation bias and wanting a certain outcome that, that, that was just going to be inevitable with this group of scientists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, notice the date on those last messages, uh, April the 16th. This is a whole month after yeah. um, Proximal Origin has been published, uh, two months after it's been drafted. And, and far from believing his own paper, he still thinks it's possible that it was a lab yeah. leak. Yeah, uh, and he's not saying that to the world. This is the time when I'm communicating with him by email, and I'm getting uh, complete denial of of a, of a lab leak back. Um, uh, uh, and so it, it, you know, remember what what what's the alternative here? What is it that really changed their minds about publishing any speculation about a lab leak? It's politics, not science. Mm -hmm. In other words, in those three days between the 1st of February and the 4th of February, when they draft the paper, and then in the days after when they strengthen the paper, they are concerned about the implications for science, the implications for relations with China, the implications for um, uh, the, uh, uh, any vindication of the Trump regime, etc. That's what's really bothering them. Hmm. As he says, you know, in that last message he, he says something about i really want to be able to go out there and say that the administration's wrong um uh yeah the wording's in there somewhere um so you know that's the that's the that's the null hypothesis here that they change their minds for political not scientific reasons yeah. and it does seem very persuasive do you uh have any background on christian anderson to you know does the does this strike you as behavior, um, you know, that's in keeping with his public or professional record? Or is this a moment where he's, you know, somebody in his shoes? I mean, I'm thinking it's like an Ibsen play or something like that, where the weight of the political world is crushing him. And he just can't really, you know, go public with what he seems to believe, which is not that it's definitely a lab leak, but that he can't rule it out. Uh, I, I'd never heard of him before this episode. Uh, I've never met him. I know nothing about his uh, biography prior to this. Uh, he is at the Scripps Institution in uh, San Diego, uh, which was um, in financial difficulty uh, about uh, a year before the pandemic and was bailed out with a partnership with the Shenzhen Institute in China. Now, that may or may not be uh, relevant. He is in receipt of large grants from the National Institutes of Health via the National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Diseases, which Tony Fauci is head of. Um, so he is, when, on these calls, he is talking to his principal funder. Yeah. And, you know, there is a conflict of interest there. There's no question about it. If he's getting the the, the vibe that uh, it would please his funder if he could rule out yeah. a lab leak, um, then it's not going to do his future funding any harm. Right. And I think that getting to these conflict of interest questions next might further illuminate why, if there was some level of pressure coming from the NIH and the NIAD, which uh, Fauci headed, why was that? Um, you know, there was uh, a really interesting email that the House committee unredacted <laughs> here. And I mean, I just pulling up this image because yeah. this is just an amazing redaction 
uh, that many journalists were trying to get for a long time. The House committee was able to get it. You know, the unredacted version says, folks, the call with Jeremy Farrar, welcome trust, redacted. Happy to chat with any of you about this. Best regards, Tony. That's what we got out of that. The, the unredacted material is actually fairly interesting. I'm going to zoom in here. Um, he's talking about these discussion, these early discussions that he had with Anderson and the team and um, that they had the suspicion that uh, there you know, might have been manipulation, which was heightened by the fact that scientists in Wuhan University are known to have been working on gain of function experiments to determine molecular mechanisms associated with bat viruses adapting to human infection and the outbreak originated in Wuhan. So right there, beginning of the pandemic is Fauci laying out that he knew about the gain of function experiments in Wuhan. He knew this was a possibility. He also knew um, about these studies that had occurred there. You mentioned Ralph Barrick earlier. This is one of the famous studies, which is a collaboration between uh, Xi, who was the head of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and Ralph Barrick, a major researcher at uh, UNC, I believe. And um, in this study, they um, uh, created a, a chimeric virus from a bat coronavirus in a mouse adapted uh, SARS CoV backbone. So they created exactly the kind of like prototype you would expect in this, this kind of research. And here's the kicker, the acknowledgements. Research was supported by grants from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and National Institute of Aging uh, and the U.S. National Institutes of Health. So Collins and Fauci's agencies. This is a January 27th email where... Um, Fauci's being alerted for the first time that his agency sent money to uh, uh, EcoHealth, which is the group that was, you know, collaborating with uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology on this research. So very early on, he was aware that these were issues that were were in the air. And so, in light of all that. I want to play kind of the, the famous back and forth clip between uh, Anthony Fauci and Rand Paul, where he puts this question directly to him. And, you know, it, it, it got a certain reaction at the, at, at the time. Uh, but now that we know more, uh, I just like people to, to see it again, maybe in a new light. So let's uh, let's pull up that clip. This research matches, these are Dr. Ebright's words, this research matches, indeed epitomizes, the definition of gain-of-function research done entirely in Wuhan, for which there was supposed to be a federal pause. Dr. Fauci, knowing that it is a crime to lie to Congress, do you wish to retract your statement of May 11th where you claimed that the NIH never funded gain-of-function research in Wuhan? Your microphone. Senator Paul, I have never lied before the Congress, and I do not retract that statement. This paper that you are referring to was judged by qualified staff up and down the chain as not being gain of function. So what was? Let me take, finish. You take an animal virus and you increase its transmissibility to humans. Right. You're saying that's not gain of function. Yeah, that is correct. And and Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly. And I want to say that officially, you do not know what you are talking about. Let's okay, you. All right, it's it's official. He does not know what he's talking about. What's your reaction to that, uh, Matt Ridley? Well. Um, uh, uh, if you go back to that exchange, there is a sort of justification for what Tony Fauci is saying. It's not a very good one, but it's it's one that he was clinging to, uh -huh. which is that there are various definitions of gain of function. And the specific definition in the U.S. funding issue is that you improve a human virus, not an animal virus, uh -huh. to make it more infectious to humans, Right. That was that's the, the the angel on the head of the pin that he's mm. that he's dancing on, but um, as you say, 
then why was he using the phrase gain of function to describe this work months earlier uh, in that email? And if you can just pull up that um, uh, hugely redacted email again, yeah. it's okay. pretty clear to me, because that email doesn't say anything terribly interesting apart from that, it's pretty clear to me that the reason for redacting that email under the Freedom of Information Act um, uh, uh, the reason for redacting the whole email was to save Anthony Fauci's mm. face after that exchange with Rand Paul. Mm. It's hard to believe that there was any other reason for doing that. Yeah, uh, It's certainly not to protect sources or to um, uh, uh, not invade the privacy of someone else or, you know, that mm. kind of thing. The, 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 the legitimate excuses for redaction are not there. This was a political redaction of an email in view of that exchange that had already happened. Could I bring up uh, someone whose name you mentioned earlier in passing, Ralph Barrick? You mentioned he's a very important and in, uh, you know accomplished uh, researcher who seems to be you know on the periphery here. W what can you tell us about the the person of Ralph Barrick and his importance to this conversation? Well, Ralph Barrick is probably the premier coronavirus uh, researcher in terms of his ability to, to manipulate these viruses. He developed several techniques, including this reverse genetics technique, which is essentially a way of, as it were, going from a sequence that you want to a live virus. Um, he developed the uh, so-called noceum technique, which is named after a biting midge that you don't um, see because it's so small, uh, which is a, effectively a way of uh, altering the genes of coronaviruses in such a way that you don't leave any scars, any joins. Um, uh, he was really the, the person who was doing spectacular new work on coronaviruses. He had an idea about how to develop uh, vaccines in this area, etc. But he's working mainly on a, this, these obscure coronaviruses that nobody's terribly interested in, and then along comes SARS-1 in 2003, and suddenly it's a much bigger deal, and then MERS, uh, and uh, suddenly coronaviruses are of great interest to the world. Uh, so when the Xi Li lab gets involved in coronavirus research because they basically are hunting down the origin of SARS-1, is where, how they start, um, and then they want to get into much more molecular work. They want to learn from Ralph Barrick. But he doesn't have access to SARS like coronaviruses because there are no uh, horseshoe bats in North America and all SARS like coronaviruses live in horseshoe bats. Uh, so they come to an arrangement that Xi Zheng Li will supply some of the uh, viruses that he needs to work on if he's going to work on SARS like coronaviruses in exchange for her learning some of the techniques of reverse genetics and genetic manipulation from him. So although both their names are on that paper, that Vinat, uh, Minachery's paper, um, uh, very, very important and significant sort of groundbreaking paper in 2015, mm -hmm. none of that work on that paper was done in, in Wuhan. It was done in North Carolina. But following that paper... The Xi Jinping Li lab, led by Ben Hu and Peng Zhou, is rapidly trying to catch up with um, Ralph Barrick uh, by uh, emulating his techniques. And one of the most important documents um, that we haven't talked about yet, which is the one that really persuaded my co-author Alina Chan and myself to come off the fence, uh, the so-called defuse proposal mm -hmm. was a request to DARPA in the Pentagon for money to do work on SARS like coronaviruses that would include inserting furin cleavage sites into them for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that work was to be done in North Carolina, right? But the proposal was turned down. And the partners to that request were the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, ben Hu's name is on it, but so is Xi Zheng Li's. So it's pretty obvious that when that was turned down in 2018 for, work, for, for that experiment to be done in North Carolina, 
it's not pretty obvious, but it's definitely possible that the Wuhan Institute of Virology said, well, we'll go ahead and do the same experiment in our lab with all our funding from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. We don't need that grant to do that work. Yeah. Indeed, they may have already started to do it because uh, the the proposal has some very specific things in it that l that read like the kind of thing you say when you apply for a grant for work you've already started. And so one plausible reason why Fauci, Collins et al. might not want people looking too closely at this or dwelling on this is, well, let's not look too closely at the fact that we were, that you know, our agencies were funneling money to this sort of research that maybe we did not directly fund the creation of this virus in a lab, but kind of like bootstrapping the technology and then like exporting it over to China where it's like completely unsupervised. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, kind of the overarching like perception right. that they don't want out there. And Ralph Barrick has played a very interesting and quite canny role in, in the debate because uh, he did not put his name, he didn't join that conference call, he didn't put his name to the Proximal Origin paper, he didn't put his name to the letter in the Lancet. He was asked if he would, and he said, no, it's better if I don't. Um, uh, and he has given one or two interviews, not very many, uh, but he gave one in, in 2021 that indicated that he still, that he, he thought it was possible that this thing might have come from a lab. So I think he's, I think he's, well aware mm -hmm. um, that the research that he developed but that was then um, taken on in Wuhan uh, could have led to the creation of this virus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I mean, I'm sure he will deny that that's what, what he thinks happened, but I think he's aware that it could be what's happened. Um, and, and he is really a very critical uh, person. Now, Interestingly, there's a there's an exchange between Anthony Fauci and uh, a congressional committee, in which he uh, says something like, "I don't know if I've ever met Ralph Barrick." Um, <laughs> well, we now know that they actually met very early in the pandemic to discuss wow. coronavirus biology. So, boy, this is starting to sound like uh, you know conversations about communist infiltration in the 1950s or something. I mean, there's a lot of skullduggery going on. Can I ask, in, in your opinion, is Anthony Fauci, and I, I don't know how to put this so, uh, you know, uh, uh, felicitously, so I'll just do it kind of bluntly. Is he deluded or is he corrupt? Is he covering his ass or does he really believe, you know, that, he understands what happened and he needs to push the conversation in that direction. I would say to that, never underestimate the human capacity for self-deception. Um, uh, Anthony Fauci is the highest paid federal employee or was until uh, he left the job. Uh, he's been in that role for something like 30 yeah. years. That's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, right. uh, I, I, yeah, he's I, like the J. Edgar Hoover of infectious disease. He's the J. Edgar uh, yeah. Hoover of infect. That's a very good line. Um, and uh, and and his role was immensely strengthened and made more imperial, if you like, in the wake of the anthrax events right. of two thousand and one, when he was effectively made part of the. Um, uh, 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 when he was made the sort of czar of the bioterror defense mm -hmm. um, research establishment. Uh, so he's, 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 you know, he's nominally under Francis Collins at the National Institute of Health, but that's not the way it mm -hmm. works. Um, uh, he's, a, he's been an enormously powerful individual, mm -hmm. controlling an enormous amount of funding. He's very articulate. He's a fabulous scientist, did wonderful work on, on HIV many years ago uh, when I first knew of his, his work. Um, but I think he has um, uh, f dug himself into a hole here that he's struggling to dig, dig himself out of. Uh, and um, I wouldn't want to use either of the words you used because mm -hmm. I don't know enough to back them up. I want to shift this to a slightly different but related topic. You know, lab leak 
theorists were often accused of positing a much more alarming and I think less, much less defensible theory about an intentional release of bioweapons. Uh, recently, some version of that idea was floated by presidential candidate RFK Jr. Let's look at some of the comments he made at a fundraising dinner posted by the New York Post last week and get your reaction to RFK. We're talking about bioweapons. Well, I know a lot now about bioweapons because I've been doing a book on it for the past two and a half years. And, um, uh, and you know, the, the, what we, the technology that we now have to develop these micro, we have, we've put hundreds of millions of dollars into uh, ethnically targeted microbes. The Chinese have done the same thing. In fact, COVID-19, there's an argument that it is ethnically targeted. COVID-19 attacks certain races um, disproportionately. The, uh, the, 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 the races that are most immune, immune to COVID-19 are because of the, of the structure of the, of, um, the genetic structure, of, 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 of genetic differentials among different races of the, um, of the receptors of the ACE2 receptor. Um, COVID-19 is targeted to attack uh, Caucasians and, uh, and, uh, and uh, black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and, uh, and Chinese. And but, we don't know whether it was deliberately targeted that or not, but there are papers out there that show the, you know, the, um, the racial and ethnic differential and of impact to that. We do know that the Chinese are spending hundreds of millions of dollars developing ethnic bioweapons, and we are developing ethnic bioweapons. That's where all those labs in the Ukraine are about. They're collecting Russian DNA. They're collecting Chinese DNA. So we can target people by race. And he subsequently, uh, I don't know, clarified that position somewhat. He, I mean, I'm trying to pull up the tweet here. Uh, he, ah, sorry, my, there we go. Uh, he said that, you know, he never suggested that the COVID-19 virus was targeted to spare Jews, uh, but he pointed out that governments are uh, developing ethnically targeted bioweapons. And then he points to a study, uh, he says a 2021 study, but it's a 2020 study that shows some variability in subgroups, uh, uh, genetic variability in, I guess, the ACE2 receptor area. Uh, you know, Ashkenazi Jews and uh, East Asians are mentioned, but so are Finnish people, South Asians, uh, Lat Latinos, um, Amish. None of those made uh, his, his list in the initial comments. But I am curious just what your reaction to RFK's concerns about ethnically targeted bioweapons might be your, your just initial gut reaction. Well, I think it's mostly um, uh, really uh, crankish conspiracy theory stuff. Frankly, um, I, I I don't uh, I, I don't buy his excuses that it's just that paper showing that there's a slight difference in the. Uh, structure of the ACE2 receptor and the way it re responds uh, in different races. Of course, there are slight differences. There always are between races. The idea that that indicates some uh, significant uh, um, uh, sort of singling out of, of, of groups. The reference yeah. to labs yeah. in Ukraine is classic um, tin tinfoil hat stuff, um, uh, I'm afraid. Um, what, what do you mean by that? Well, the, uh, there's been there's been a sort of strange rumor floating around that there was some kind of lab in Ukraine controlled by the Biden ad administration or the Biden family um, uh, that uh, that was uh, that was involved in uh, bioweapon research, and at one point it was linked to COVID nineteen in very specifically now you know i haven't looked into this very carefully i don't waste my time on this kind of mm -hmm. thing but you know yes there are biological laboratories in ukraine as there are in most countries but the 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 idea that they were connected with 
specific bioweapons, let alone coronavirus bioweapons, I'm afraid just doesn't stand up. Um, so uh, I think he's uh, half understood something um, and got way carried away with it, made a remark in an off-the-record session, section, session that, uh, that he can't justify based on the scientific paper he's, he's adduced. Uh, and um, I think it's highly unlikely that the Chinese authorities who were working on SARS-like coronaviruses in the Wuhan Institute of Virology were aware of or were deliberately causing some kind of ethnic differential in the susceptibility of people to this uh, virus or to related viruses. Um, uh, this disease caused devastation in China as well as elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, there are some ethnic differences in how much people suffer from this disease, but a lot of them are down to social factors. It's very hard to tease out what might be genetic as opposed to social. Um, and if that's the best evidence that this might be a deliberate bioweapon as opposed to an accidental release, then it's not very good evidence. Wasn't there, um, at least through 2020, didn't, weren't there studies in the UK showing that Jews actually died at a higher incidence rate than the general population from COVID? I don't know. I can't, I can't yeah. answer that. I haven't seen that. You know, if, uh, you know, we all kind of accept that COVID was not likely to be an engineered bioweapon. I mean, it, like, as you said, it wouldn't really make sense the way that it, it all played out. There does appear to be a lot of viral research that has an overlap with national security, uh, the national security apparatus. I guess they call it dual use. Um, how concerned, you know, should we be in general about bioweapons at this point? Um, you know, is now the time to start talking about it more now that we have seen what a even an accidental release or spillover, whatever the case might be, can do to the planet? And is there anything that can be done about it? Yes, I think now is the time to be concerned because this episode, has, as, I, as I said earlier, shown bad actors what, what, what could, could be done. And therefore, there must be some interest in developing bioweapons in terrorist organizations and rogue states. Um, uh, clearly, there is bioweapon research going on in America, in Britain, in China, in Russia, in other countries. Uh, but most of it is defensive. That is to say, you know, on the whole, the Chinese are concerned about a bioterror incident, uh, about someone unleashing a virus at the Beijing Olympics, for example. And they appointed uh, the major general who's now in charge of the Wuhan Institute of Virology to, to, to um, develop um, surveillance techniques to try and make sure that didn't happen during the Beijing Olympics. Um, so... Uh, you, you know, the, the stance of the U.S., uh, certainly Britain, uh, and, and ostensibly China, has been in recent years, the reason we do this kind of research is so that we can defend against a bioterror incident or possibly a biowarfare incident, mm -hmm. not because we want to use it offensively ourselves. Now, um, where do you know at what point does defense blur into offense is a good question and uh are there labs where secretly uh some of these countries don't obey that um guidance and do go further and say let's see if we can use something that we could stick in a weapon and throw at our enemies and kill them before they uh, it has a chance to infect us and so on um uh, and that did used to go on in the Cold War, big time. Yeah, mm -hmm. no question that you know anthrax and others were being weaponized for that use. But uh, this is where the International Convention on Biological Weapons—I can't remember quite what the acronym, uh, how it spells out—but that's roughly what it's called—is um, a very important um, treaty, and it has very little teeth. It's not like the uh, nuclear weapons um, agreements at all. Uh, and it really should be 
uh, looked at pretty urgently by the United Nations and by um, uh, the by world powers. You know, I hope that Antony Blinken is talking about that with his counterpart in China when they meet. How do how do you reckon we deal with China at this point? Because, you know, there, you know, one thing we didn't talk about, another piece of circumstantial evidence that has come out recently is we knew we've known for a while that there were some researchers in the lab that became ill in November of 2019, uh, you know, beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the, the new information that's come to light is that one of those researchers was Ben Hu, a scientist at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, who worked you know, side by side with Xi on these uh, bat coronaviruses, um, on how they infect humans. And a U.S. intelligence report I, uh, identifies his, uh, him as one of the researchers who became ill um, we have to, you know, qualify that and say that American officials said they were that the illness was consistent with either COVID-19 or other seasonal illnesses. It, the what the illness was has not been conclusively established. Part of the reason for that is that China has not relinquished any blood samples, for instance, of their workers that might have been taken at the hospital. And it's kind of part of the general pattern, uh, especially early on, of China being this black box where you can't get any good data out of there. They're shutting down the wet market. They're shutting down research papers that look at inconvenient questions. How do you deal with a regime like that when you're trying to create some sort of treaty to, to get this global danger under control or under heel? Yeah, it, the, the lack of transparency has been truly shocking. And, and also shocking was the World Health Organization praising China for its transparency during this lack of transparency. Um, but, uh, you know, not revealing the, the genetic database that they had in, in, in the lab, not revealing what happened uh, in those early cases, not talking about those uh, sick researchers, uh, etc. Now, Ben Hu did come forward after that Wall Street Journal uh, article and uh, give an interview to science saying, no, no, I'm fine. I, there was never, never anything wrong with me. But we just can't trust that kind of information these days. Um, ben Hu, Yu Ping and Yan Zhou, the three who allegedly got sick, are all highly relevant people. They're all working in exactly this area of SARS-like coronavirus research. So if they did get sick, and we are told that they had ground glass opacities in their lungs, which are a pretty diagnostic feature, um, uh, th then, you know, it, it, it's of, of, of great relevance. Interestingly, the reason that came out, those three names came out a few weeks ago, was because there was a deadline for the US government under a congressional uh, act to uh, release the information that they held about what happened in Wuhan or what happened to the researchers in particular. And it was supposed to name the researchers and give the details. Mm. And when the deadline passed, the uh, administration released only a brief summary without the names, without the details, and a week late. And uh, around that time, uh, Michael Schellenberger got the information first, the Wall Street Journal then got it second. Um, there were administration officials who were prepared to release those names uh, seek, uh, privately, uh, to leak those names. Um, because they were frustrated that the uh, um, administration was not going to obey the congressional um, directive and was not going to include the names. So it's clear that the Biden administration, at the time, remember, Anthony Blinken was on his way to Beijing at that very week. Uh, it's clear that the Biden administration was trying to bowdlerize this obligation that they had in order not to offend the Chinese uh, government. Um, we're in a very difficult situation in the world where we are... Um, uh, trading and dealing with uh, a, a, an organization we just can't trust anymore. Um, mm. That's a pretty serious position to have found ourselves in. But it also leads to, I mean, a problem as you're kind of talking about, the United States government is also, and many of its chief actors, 
are also the antithesis of transparent at this point and have given us many reasons not to trust them in any given uh, announcement. Well, exactly. And as I hinted earlier, a lot of the redaction we're seeing when they do respond to freedom of information requests are driven by political convenience and avoiding embarrassment, which is not supposed to be a good reason for redacting uh, information. So Uh, can we talk a little bit about um, the role of Drastic, uh, the group, as well as open communication and free speech, you know, both in this particular instance where you had governments of all different types, you know, basically refusing to come clean or to be open and transparent with with its citizens and with the scientific community even. Um, and the role that, you know, in your work consistently, you've talked about how, you know, not just political liberalism, but the advance of science, of material, technical, scientific, even moral progress really depends upon an open and free exchange of ideas. Um, and we seem to be in a new era where it's not simply governments that are you know, putting the boot to things. You mentioned people like Michael Schellenberger. Uh, we've talked about, I think, Matt Taibbi. We've uh, uh, invoked him. But we've seen in this you know, episode in particular the absolute collusion between media outlets, including social media outlets, but also news, you know, more traditional news outlets. Talk a little bit about what are the important lessons that need to be drawn from our, you know, the way that we talk about things, if we're going to have not simply a free society, but one which actually, you know, where people can start to debate ideas. Um, When you and I talked uh, for a reason at the very start in March of 2020, at the very start of COVID. And you had said in that conversation, uh, that there's no monopoly on wisdom, which is one of the reasons why we need to have as many people participating in discussions as possible. Where are we on that? And how do we, how do we make that more robust? Yeah, it's a, it's a superb question. And you, you put the point well, and you know, for me, the shocking thing of this episode has been how useless the mainstream has been mm-hmm. to our investigation. I, by that, I mean mainstream media, which didn't want to know about this topic. Mainstream science journalists, you know, most of whom were completely in the camp of um, uh, uh, being stenographers for the scientific establishment, not mm-hmm. being people who were prepared to do investigative work. Uh, uh, Mainstream politicians, who on the whole didn't want to dig into this stuff. Um, uh, The the intelligence community, which, you know, I had conversations, I, I joke about this and I'm perhaps exaggerating, but I had conversations with intelligence officials you know who breathlessly told me in in very secretive tones things that i'd not only read i'd written (laughs) Uh, and you know so so uh, the people who are paid and and then of course mainstream scientists as well the people who are paid large sums of money by governments or or by big media organizations to make this free society work were asleep at the switch on this issue and the people who broke the news, who, who found things out of incredible importance, were people like The Seeker, a young man in India who uh, dug into Chinese websites and found crucial academic and medical theses. People like Francisco Rivera, a Spanish citizen without a job, sitting at home, who knows how to use databases and, and developed a, a brilliant technique for discovering exactly where the Chinese scientists had collected bat samples on which days and from which species. Um, uh, uh, people like um, Gilles Damaneuf, a, um, a, a business consultant in New Zealand who, of French origin, who um, uh, has been extraordinarily good at working out exactly what happened in Wuhan in those early days, including how many people got sick and, and who they were and which hospitals they went to and so on. These are informal internet sleuths, we mm-hmm. called them. Um, I don't want to leave anyone out. Drastic was the sort mm-hmm. of umbrella name for, for, for a number of them. Um, they were unpaid, 
they were uh, unemployed in many cases, or at least doing it in their spare time. And that's an extraordinary part of the story that I don't want to get lost. And I, I, have, I see a tendency when even the lab leakers get together and have a conference or they do a podcast or something to leave that aspect out. And I think that's a pity because it really does show how the citizen has a role to play even in this high-tech world. Um, and uh, good for these Davids that they went in there and threw a, uh, threw a stone at some Goliaths. How do you, uh, at the by the same token, you know, and we're in an age where trust and confidence in all sorts of institutions, you know, continues to go lower and lower. Um, the internet and other tele, you know, uh, technologies allow for this type of activity. Expertise is probably at a low ebb for very good reasons, but expertise exists. How do we empower, you know, these types of people, or how do we benefit from that? without crossing over into the RFK Jr. territory, where we just become sitting ducks for every conspiracy theory that kind of scratches an itch that we, you know, that we have, that we may not even recognize? Uh, it's, the, it's a terribly difficult question to which I don't have a good answer. Uh, I come across this problem all the time. I deal with individuals who have done some brilliant work and found out something important, but then go too far and dive into speculative conspiracy theories that, that can't be justified. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and, and it's, it's one of the, it's one of the hardest jobs as someone who writes about science as I have done for 40 years to Take heretics seriously, but not fall for charlatans. Mm -hmm. And to, to to decide when whether when someone is a is a, 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 a mav when a maverick is a, is a is a heretic who should be taken seriously, or a charlatan who should be ignored, it's terribly difficult. And we have the institutions specifically to give us that. To say, oh, well, he's a professor at such and such university, so we can trust him. But we can no longer do that because, I'm sorry, a lot of these professors are now uh, extraordinarily subject to dogmatic groupthink and uh, herd mentality. And um, we have to have individuals who are not like that. And uh, we have to... And so all I can do is say, you talk to these guys... You read their stuff, and two pages in, your alarm bells go off and say, no, this stuff's nutty, mm -hmm. or they don't. That cautionary note is probably a good one to end on. Matt Ridley, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. You've done great work putting together all those clips, so that was really helpful. <laughs> Thanks.